All right, one of the means by which we help our students improve is by showing the games of other beginners and intermediate players. And um, tonight is no exception between none other than Pete Glazer, my best friend, and myself. Back at the Carmody Junior High School Championship on January 16th, this was the very first round that we happened to get paired together, uh, January 16th, 1978. <clears throat> and we will do, as we always do, go through the moves and invite you, the viewer, to make comment, to ask questions, to give your opinion, and... Um, we work together to have an optimal level of instruction and education. So without further delay, let's go ahead and begin. On to d4 by Pete, and then knight f6, the Indian game. And it's an East Indian with e6. Nowadays, I play d6 and go with the old indian but e6 back in those days uh let's see 1978 yeah roughly uh roughly six years um actually it would have been just over five years because i started uh december 25th 1972 which means December 25th, 1977 would have been five years. So this is the first month of the sixth year. All right, so we have knight c3, and uh, bishop b4 is the Nimzo Indian defense. Now, let's stop here. What is the strategy behind the Nimzo Indian uh, defense? Um, what is the the point of this defense? Does anybody happen to know? Are, do we have any Nimzo players out there? Nimzo Indian players? Anybody, anybody, anybody? Uh, because I will tell you, but it'd be nice to hear from you, the viewer. Why do people play the Nimzo Indian defense? Uh, I'll give you a hint. What does white want to do here after this knight to c3 move? What is, what is white's goal? What's his threat? That's right, Tebow to Baker. His threat is to play pawn to e4 and um, establish a dominant and or domineering position in the center. And of course, the usual method of parrying the threat is pawn to d5 by occupying the center. But here's another approach. We pin the white knight to the king, and we basically achieve the same objective. We prevent pawn to e4, because we undermine the defense of e4 by pitting the knight. And we can always play d5 anyway later on, if we so desire. <clears throat> Very good, Tebow to Baker. So a3. And what's the purpose of a3? And uh, does it have any drawbacks? Why play a3? That's right, uh, uh, George. He doesn't. He doesn't want to let this uh, pin abide even for a moment. He wants to get rid of it immediately, if not sooner. Now, what what is the possible drawback of playing a three? What is the possible drawback? of playing a3 and what would you play to avoid that drawback so the real drawback actually emery guy um was touching on it earlier black can at the cost of the bishop pair 
double white's pawns. And this particular pawn on c4 becomes unwieldy and is uh, very easy to um, subject to pressure. For example, by maybe knight c6, knight a5, pawn b6, and bishop a6. So um, that could be the drawback. And if you want to avoid that, there's only one real good way to avoid that, and it's with bishop to um, d2. And that says, okay, if you take my knight, I'm taking your bishop, and I'm not doubling my pawns. But, yes, Emery guy, um, the truth of the matter is, um, White, White gets compensated for his doubled pawns in the form of the bishop pair. And so, by the way, this is same-ish variation. And now c5. And what is the purpose of c5? There are actually three purposes. See if you can touch on any of them. Why pawn to c5? Yeah, well, if he takes, <laughs> sure, if he takes, that would be really bad, wouldn't it? Um, the idea, number one, is to lock c4 in place. It's called fixing the pawn, not fixing as in repairing, but fixing as in making it a fixture. You're fixing it in place. And uh, so because it's fixed in that spot, it can be more easily attacked when the time is right. Secondly, by pushing this pawn, we're planning to open the C file and get our rook to C8. And uh, number three, um, we're opening the door for our queen for a potential powerful counter attack on A5. Now, I played c5, but what if black plays knight e4, attacking this backward c pawn? Um, my question is whether or not knight f3 is a feasible reply. Is knight f3 a feasible reply to knight e4 threatening the pawn. And Ruby says no. Don't just say yes or no, guys. Tell me why. Why, Ruby? Why is this not a feasible reply for, for white? Or if you believe it is, if anybody out there believes it is, don't just say yes, that's feasible. Tell me why. And if you don't think it's feasible, you should offer an alternative reply. Pool Heater says, well, the pawn is hanging. So I will say this. Capturing the, um, playing knight f3 by white is feasible, though it is not optimal. Um, it's feasible because this is not a real threat. Full heater. Um, the truth of the matter is, if I if black takes this pawn, the knight gets trapped by queen c2, and you've won a pawn, but you've lost a knight. Where can the knight go? Everything is hot. So knight f3 is a feasible reply. It might not be the best and most optimal reply. Okay. On the c5 was played in the game. And now, pawn to f3. And ben Feingold will tell you, never play pawn to f3. 
But this is actually a book move. And who can tell me what is the purpose of pawn to f3 in this position? What is the purpose of pawn to f3? There's another purpose besides preventing the knight from encroaching in the center. What is another purpose um, for, pawn, for pawn to f3? That's right, Frost X Fire is right on the money. The purpose of Pawn F3, besides preventing any encroachment by the Black Knight, is to prepare Pawn to E4. Again, Tebow to Baker pointed it out in the very beginning that White would love to establish this massive center. Now let's suppose Black um, uh, White had played Bishop G5 instead. How should black answer such a move as this? On takes. Ah, George has it right there. Yeah, get this queen. Remember the purpose of c5. One of the purposes of c5. Ogus Pogus has followed. One of the purposes of c5 was to open the a5 d8 diagonal so the queen could play queen a5. And that would compel the bishop to come back to defend this. Not a move like queen c2, where now c takes d4 can be played as that pawn is pinned and black has initiative. And definitely not, and I mean definitely not, bishop takes knight, um, bishop takes knight where Queen takes pawn check is simply winning only one legal move. And bye-bye, rookie. I eat you like a cookie. Oh, yeah! So, very good, guys. Well done. So, pawn to f3. Pawn to d5. C pawn takes D pawn. Knight takes pawn. And queen C2 here. Question. Is pawn to C4 attacking the knight a viable alternative for white? Is pawn to C4 attacking the knight a viable alternative for white and don't just say yes or no give your reasons you give your reasons by giving your continuation he says it's legal i didn't ask if it's legal is it a good choice is the question that viable means is it something that would work that's right ogus pogus Black could play the knight to c3. Very good, August Pogus. If he plays knight to c3, hitting the queen, and then at wherever the queen moves to safety, pawn takes pawn, puts that knight on an outpost. So, definitely not. Now, so, somebody suggested, uh, it's Pepe suggested, pawn to e4 would be better. So let's rephrase the question. Hello, Ashen One. Is pawn to e4 attacking the knight a viable alternative for white? Is pawn to e4 attacking the knight a viable alternative for white? Queen h4. Queen h4 loses material after, after uh, pawn to g3. Yeah, so actually, it's um, it's even worse. Thank you, Ashen One. It's even worse. It's the same thing. It's just different because in this example, black picks up a pawn for his trouble. 
Now, this gives us a valuable insight into the position. Although White has gotten rid of his double pawns, well, he's gotten rid of all of his pawns. Uh, but here, although White has gotten rid of his doubled pawns, he needs to be very careful how he goes because his center is shaky and ha hastily advancing your pawns may bring about a collapse of your structure, um, which, considering the inevitability of pawn at E form, that structure can seem to be imposing, but if you're not careful, you will get yourself in trouble. So, instead, queen to c2 was played. Uh, knight to c6. Knight to c6. Now, here my question is, can black play... Pawn takes pawn instead with the continuation pawn takes pawn, queen to h4 check, and after g3, queen takes d4. Is that a good continuation for black to pick up an extra pawn? Don't just say yes or no. Give me a reason. Anybody, anybody, anybody? Okay, Frost says, not a good idea because Bishop really just hits a lot of targets on the long diagonal. That's uh, a good answer. Another alternative, full credit, if you saw Queen takes Bishop check. And then after king gets out of check, queen takes pawn check. And yeah, it just gets ugly. But coming back to Frost's continuation, after bishop to b2 hitting the queen, when the queen escapes, you're still going to pick up this bishop with check. And it does not look too great for black. So, good job, everybody. Therefore, now, by the way, you can play pawn takes pawn. That's actually fine. But you cannot play the continuation thinking you're picking up an extra pawn. Every uh, Playing pawn takes pawn should be fine. But just after he takes back, continue developing and getting your pieces out of bed. <clears throat> I should hasten to say that. It's not pawn takes pawn itself that's bad, but the, the idea of picking up an extra pawn that's bad because, yeah, the high cost of free pawns is the title of the program, guys. And that so-called free pawn cost black not only major material, but ultimately that would cost him the game. All right. Now pawn e4 is finally played. So knight to f6. And bishop to b5 was played. Question I have here is what about playing e5? What about playing e5, attacking the knight? What is your take on e5? Yeah, it, it um, reopens d5 for the knight. And that commits white too much. It gives him too much of a... Um, he, he doesn't want to allow this. These pawns, this classic pawn center. And if you've not viewed my YouTube video on the classic pawn center, be sure to hit exclam YouTube and go over to YouTube later on or tomorrow and check out the Scholastic Chess Lessons playlist. In that playlist, you'll find three videos about the center of the board and the classic pawn center. You'll want to be sure to check that out. We don't want to break our classic pawn center, a.k.a. ideal pawn center, 
uh, without provocation or without adequate support. And so we don't want to commit there where um, knight d5 would be played with strong pressure on this strained center here. You got this looking here, this looking here, this looking here. Um, it's just not a good idea. And if he tries something like um, bishop b2, turning the bishop into a tall pawn, well, again, we have ideas like queen e5, or even knight to e3 would be interesting. Um, right? And, um, but on queen e5 and pawn to b6, you also have ideas of bishop a6 that can be played. And, right, um, black has some easy initiative in this example. Okay, so bishop b5, pinning the knight. Bishop d7, breaking the pin. Hello, Comedron. And now pawn takes pawn. Now, is this a satisfactory move? How do you like pawn takes pawn here? If you were paying attention during the last pause in question, you already know what I think of this. Right, I mean, he broke his ideal pawn center for no reason. It's, it's a poor move. And it, look what it does to the pawn structure besides. Not only do you give up the pawn center that was so beautiful, you, um, you uh, really make a Horlix of your of your queenside structure. It looks like Swiss cheese over there. And um, there's no real compensating advantage for this. Black can easily regain this pawn. Um, and in fact, it's so easy to pick this pawn back up at some point, I don't even have to be in a hurry to pick it back up because these are such easy targets. And furthermore, it allows pressure on the C file that will uh, be very strong against these doubled pawns. And uh, we'll see this, this um, the fatality of this free pawn. Again, the, the name of the title, the title of the program is the high cost of free pawns. And this is yet another example. In fact, this is the punctuating example of the entire lesson in order to maintain this pawn even temporarily white's going to have to give up his bishop pair with uh, bishop takes knight uh, so and of course when that happens all the light squares become terribly weak particularly c4 by the way so what should white have played instead Immaculately angelic has followed. Yes, Amir Ali, yes, yes, yes. It's clear that White would have been well advised to simply avoid these difficulties in his structure and simply developed his knight. That would have been much better. So, pawn takes pawn, making Swiss cheese of his structure, giving black targets to aim at, queen to a5, bishop takes the knight, bishop takes the bishop, and now, as mentioned, weakness along this diagonal in particular, and on the light squares in general. Bishop to e3, rook to d8, and knight to e2. Well, okay, speaking of this knight, would it have been better to play first 
queen to b2 because you can see with this queen attacking here and only one defender my plan is to play knight to d7 super attacking so would it have been better to play queen to b2 so that when i super attack the pawn he can play queen to b4 Scruston says, well, it may, maybe. It, it seems like it could be promising. The truth is, though, of course, black is not compelled to trade queens. And um, queen a6, don't forget, the trading of bishops leaves all of these squares terribly weak. And what better way to punctuate that weakness than to occupy that diagonal with my queen? And so, no... This really does not do white any favors um, at all. All it does is get his queen where it can't move anywhere else. So knight to e2, knight to d7, kingside castle, knight takes pawn. And really emphasizing the error of move number 11 by white where he took that pawn that so-called free pawn well it didn't turn out to be free any anyway all it did was weaken his structure and that pawn has been uh recaptured now took a little while uh but it did get recaptured and it was an easy recapture so I've got a pretty easy time exploiting the weak light squares, increasing pressure on the on the uh, remaining C man here will be pretty easy. And um, so basically, White voluntarily created the 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 very weapon for his own downfall. He um, he assisted, which reminds us of a very nice. Um, Oscar Pano, no, no, uh, Savielli Tartikover quote, who said, I've never won a chess game in my life. And when asked about that quote, how can you say that when you've won many, many, many chess games? He says, nope, nope, never won one. Uh, it is my opponent who has lost. Oh, yeah. Truth of the matter is, chess is a game of mistakes. If neither side makes a mistake, neither side will win. It will be a draw. And so none of us technically win our games. It is our opponent who loses, Savielli Tartikova tells us. All right, so. Knight to d4 here. Bishop to a4. A metabolic error says... Uh, back here instead of castling keep your king toward the center and play king to f2 yeah maybe especially if you can somehow force a queen trade all right knight d4 bishop to a4 hitting the queen queen to b2 pawn to b6 supporting the knight Queen to b4 is now played, ironically. But just as in the hypothetical example of queen b4, black plays queen a6. Now, is that a good move? Is that queen well placed there? What about knight d3? Amir Ali says, could be support for knight d3. Yes, Ogus Pogus, yeah. Uh, well, not so much that it's hitting the rook next to the king. The rook is defended twice. We're not going to give up our, our queen for the rook. But don't forget, again, the emphasis of when he captured bishop takes knight on c6... This weaknesses on these light squares were created, and these squares have to be defended um, to prevent any kind of an invasion, like knight d3, for example. So, okay, what should white try 
in this position. White's in a little bit of a pickle. What should he try? I've got all these light squares under my control. And I've got all these light squares under my control. Wow. That's power right there. Well, it's a diagonal with C5. You mean C4. I didn't think about that, but I, I, I guess I'll give you credit for that answer. You could try moving the pawn to C4. Temporarily closing that diagonal. That softens uh, d4 a little bit, but it is defended by the bishop. I was just thinking in terms of these rooks that um, white, you know, he's positionally in a bad way. And if he hopes to put up a fight, he needs to get these rooks somehow active. So I was just thinking of rook a2 followed by rook to d2. The problem again is he can't move to d1 with either rook uh, because of the attack on d1 by the bishop. These, uh, dark, these light square weaknesses are really haunting um, white. But he does need to dispute the d-file as well. But not being able to double on that d-file is also going to be costly. So even at that, my, my idea can't be all that promising. Maybe, um, maybe, um, um, who, who said C4 again? Yorg, right? Yoerg's idea. Maybe that might be more, slightly more promising to maybe try to create some, but even this square is under control. There's, it, there's no way to double on the open file for, um, for white. He has no real way of doing it. So he's in a bad way. I mean, I, I really feel like I'm already winning this game. Um, he tried bishop to g5. What do you suppose is the purpose of this move? Yeah, he's trying to weaken e6 and weaken the king structure in general. He's hoping to, um, to provoke f6 if he can provoke f6 that does create a slight weakness in the in that position now frankly this so-called weakness could actually be created if so desired but that bishop isn't going to stay there very long um he's going to have to retreat anyway and he's going to find this is not very effective. So instead, simply rook to d7. Now he did try with uh, rook a2. And as awkward as that appears, I, I don't really know what to suggest differently, you know, unless we go back to Yorg's suggestion of c4. But even c4... You know, well, you can't now because you've moved your bishop now. Sorry. The bishop's no, no longer even defending the knight. So you can't do that now. So, yeah. What else is he going to play? I, I would not even begin to suggest an alternative here. It's, uh, there's just, it's, it's just too many, it's too futile. There's no hope here. As, even though it looks like it's fairly equal, um, black is the one with the initiative and in the driving seat. Rook to d2. Pawn to h6. Now he retreats that bishop. 
Knight to d3, the predicted move by many. Hits the queen. Queen to b1. And after knight e5, black has maneuvered to exert pressure on the c4 square. It is completely undefended. And that um, situation is pretty much tied back to move 11 when white took that supposedly free pawn. So, rook d to f2. What an unfortunate looking move. And he, what does he have? Can't play here. Could play here. But he really, all he can do is take up the entire game has been white in, in a defensive stance. Um, as soon as, well, from move 11 on, white has been on his heels. He was actually okay in the opening. But, Well, yeah, I mean, f4 can be played, but, you know, knight c4 is coming. So, rook to f2. I guess f4 is couldn't be any worse than anything else. I mean, you could play f4. Maybe you could get this rook over here and, and push this pawn. But no, I'm just going to occupy that square before you could ever do it. Metabolic error would have played f4 three moves three moves ago. Hold on. One, two, three. He would have played f4 here. You play f4 here, you're you're giving up your e pawn. If I even bother taking it. Because my knight and my pieces are so dominant, that pawn might not even be worth my trouble. Because remember, the high cost of free pawns. Yeah, he's saying if you take that, knight takes e6 is played. And that discovers an attack on the knight. Yeah, the high cost of free pawns. Another good example right there. The high cost of free pawns. That's a good point, metabolic error. Be careful about these free pawns, ladles and jelly spoons. All right, so anyway, it was uh, rook d to f2. <laughs> Eth says, I just started playing with gambits. I will never trust a free pawn again. All right, so the last rook gets into the game, rook to c8. And what a pathetic position for white. He played queen to a1. And another consequence, yet another consequence, of the grabbing of the free pawn on move 11. It's painfully noticeable here. Look at look at every other alternative and see how bad white, white's position really is. Um, is rook to c1 an alternative here? So that loses the exchange to black. Likewise, um, what other alternatives are there? I mean, if you play queen to c1, it's the exact same thing. It's just different. You play queen to e1, exact same thing, just different, that's all. And so, well, maybe we don't move one of the majors. Maybe we move uh, our knight, uh, for example, if we're white. Uh, can, can that knight go to anywhere? Well, it doesn't really matter where, where that knight goes. We're, but really, in this case, we'll probably go... We'll just do the same thing. It's just 
uh, different no matter what we do. Um, no matter what our opponent does. Unless he plays bishop to d2, then for sure we'll play the same thing. It's just, uh, it's just different. In that case, he can play rook e2, but after e5 and um, knight to f5, let's say, well, it is just trouble. Black just is dominating. So. Yeah, the poor queen moving to a1, <clears throat> and the weakness of the light squares is uh, once again punctuated, punctuated by uh, this activity that that black has in on the board. All right, so uh, queen d3, queen d3, bishop to f4. And now knight to c4. Does anybody happen to know the purpose of knight to c4? Uh, knight to c4 was what I played. What was the purpose? Right. So the purpose uh, is not just to get out of danger. The purpose is not just to get out of danger. What else happens as a result of knight c4? What threat is created by Knight to c4. Yes, that's right, Joerg. Yes. We are going to play on to e5, forking the enemy knight and bishop, threatening to win a piece. He played bishop to c1, and is he not on his heels? Wow. What an unfortunate necessity. Knight to e3 now, attacking the rook, forces the bishop to um, take. Uh, well, I say forces. Well, how would, how would rook to e1 be answered? Let's answer that. No, not knight to c2, Amir Ali. If you play knight to c2, you're losing your knight uh, in a trade. And that actually will give white an advantage because after rook to d2, um, bam. I have to give up my queen for that rook and, and get the, the rook and the minor. And now it's a rook and a minor against a queen. That, that would not be beneficial. So not, um, not knight to c2. Not knight to c2. Um, Gideon says, why not give up the exchange? Why not take here and then, and then play knight to c2? And then play knight to c2. That, that might be playable, but even here, since he's losing material anyway, he might just place takes, and then after takes, um, you know, this he's back in the game. It's I play bishop e3, bishop f4. Point is, he's still fighting here. He's still fighting. So we're not going to play that line. Interesting idea, Gideon. Not a bad idea. Uh, but I don't think it's the, the most optimal. No, I think black's best bet, and, you know, this might be white's best bet, actually. Might have been a more hopeful move. Uh, but I'm going to play knight to d1. Knight to d1 here. And I guess he could still play rook here, but now after takes, um, the queen is undefended. And I, my queen is defended. So it's not as, um, he does not have the follow-up. I'm not forced to give up any, any material here. He, he pretty much has to trade queens. And black's, um, black's position is better, plus I have an extra pawn. Yeah, sure, if you're playing an engine, engines are, are, are better than we are. 
if you're using an engine, uh, this might not be as good as, as I think. Maybe, uh, you know, I'd probably lose to the engine from this position. All right, so anyway, bishop takes knight. Um, queen takes bishop. Rook to c1. And, and this was a blunder. This was a blunder. Oh, how should black get a decisive position here? We are sacking the rook uh, for the knight. The point is this. Notice... The rook here is only defended once, and it is attacked twice. And so, therefore, this pawn is actually pinned. Because the pawn is pinned, therefore, the knight is undefended and can be taken with impunity. Bada-bing, bada-boom. Now, um, if white had played... Knight e2 here. Before I show the conclusion to the game. If white had played knight e2, how would would black need to continue here? And and really, I'm not even gonna ask for answers because there are a lot of ways black can continue here. Never mind. I mean, pick one. There's so many ways for black to win. I'm bound to like one of them. I could play. For example, bishop b5. Bishop b5 is going to be strong if he plays rook d1, takes, takes, takes. Just simplify and get these pawns picked up. I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways. Uh, maybe I'll play... Maybe I'll play rook d2. There are, there are so many ways to win. You've got to like one of them. You've got to like one of these. All right, so knight e2, no no real help after this. Um, I feel like black is just plain uh, dominating here. Well, he played rook c1. He, he uh, blundered. Rook takes knight. Um... He um, he realized he couldn't take, so he tried attacking the queen. So queen takes pawn, rook to f, uh, rook to f one, and I just realized I had a whole piece advantage here. Just begin to trade down, just trade pieces, not pawns. Try to simplify, and so when you can force trades, do. The queen took queen. Rook took queen, and now I'm going to double. I'm going to get pigs on the seventh and get this rook here, this rook here. Seeing that, he just said, okay, I'm not going to let you get pigs on the seventh. So he had to give up another trade. And then from here, um, I'm not sure why he gave up a trade here, but he did. And now it's just a matter of time. And I'm just going to page through the moves here that were played so that you can see the finish. It's just a matter of getting him in Sugsvang until he has no good moves. And now he's out of moves. I'm going to make a passed pawn here. And it was here that he resigned.